Bun găsit la emisiunea Știință și Cunoaștere. Continuăm prezentarea celor mai devastatoare boli ale secolului 21 cu ajutorul invitatului special, profesorul Michael Fossel. Astăzi vom vorbi despre ateroscleroză. Cele patru grupe de maladii asociate cu îmbătrânirea sunt accidentul vascular cerebral, despre care am vorbit în prima emisiune, Alzheimer, despre care am vorbit în emisiunea a doua, Parkinson, despre care am vorbit în a treia emisiune, și a patra este ateroscleroza, despre care vom vorbi în minutele următoare. Ca un prolog la ceea ce vom discuta în minutele următoare, citez o scurtă prezentare de pe Wikipedia care conturează bazele de înțelegere a acestei maladii. Ateroscleroza este o maladie cardiovasculară caracterizată de formarea la nivelul tunicii interne și medii a arterelor mijlocii și mari, de depozite și plăci ateromatoase, ce conțin colesterol, material lipidic și lipofage. Efectele și complicațiile bolii asupra creierului, inimii, extremităților și altor organe constituie cauza majoră a morbidității și mortalității în țările vesice, o treime din decesele la persoane cu vârsta cuprinsă între 35 și 65 de ani. Placa ateromatoasă creată este alcătuită din trei regiuni distincte. Ateromul, o acumulare nodulară a unui material gălbui, ușor, situat în centrul plăcilor mari și alcătuit din macrofage, Apoi, cristale de colesterol LDL situate adiacent ateromului și calcifieri ale exteriorului unor reziuni mai vechi sau mai avansate. Plăcile ateromatoase, deși sunt compensate de lărgirea arterelor, în cele din urmă duc la rupturi ale plăcilor și implicit chiaguri. Acestea se lecuiesc și se micșorează, dar pot duce la stenoza arterelor sau chiar mai rău la blocajul acestora. Dacă procesul lărgirii arterelor este excesiv, poate rezulta un anevrism. Complicațiile aterosclerozei avansate sunt cronice, progresive și chiar acumulative. Cel mai des, plăcile ușoare se rup cauzând formarea unui tromb care va încedini sau va opri fluxul sanguin, ducând la moartea țesutului alimentat de artere în aproximativ 5 minute, adică infarct. Ateroscleroza poate afecta astfel orice arteră din corp. Despre toate acestea vom vorbi detaliat în minutele următoare. Dear Professor Michael Fossel, welcome back to our TV program Science and Knowledge in Romania for the amazing part four of his new mini-series of interviews via Skype. Thank you very much and it's an honor to be with you, Christian. All these episodes might represent the best educational TV programs in making the public aware and I thank you, you greatly for this opportunity. My pleasure. The fourth and final part in our interview series of age-related diseases is about atherosclerosis. Please tell us what is atherosclerosis. Well, it's funny because you, it, technically you'll find these differences, academic differences in many ways, between atherosclerosis and arteriosclerosis. And, and from my perspective, though, you can lump all of these diseases in terms of age-related changes in the arterial system. And, That includes atherosclerosis, arteriosclerosis, coronary artery disease, myocardial infarction, uh, peripheral vascular disease, um, congestive heart failure. <clears throat> from, from my perspective, it looks like all of these share some underlying factors. It, it's like those differences I see in definitions between Alzheimer's and other dementias. They're right, but <clears throat> they're, underlying, they're underlying causes that, that lump all of those together. The same is true of these diseases, arteriosclerotic diseases in general, or arterial diseases of aging in general. From our perspective, they're all linked together because of some common changes that occur in the pattern of gene expression of the cells that line the arteries and even other vessels, even the veins and the, and the capillaries as well. So I could call them age-related vascular diseases generically. They all share underlying factors. So while there are technical differences between these and some major ones clinically, they all share a common denominator. And that's a common denominator that I can use clinically to try to prevent and cure these diseases. We have a myth regarding one of the causes of the arteriosclerosis, and I'd like to help me get rid of it. If you have two patients, one is having high level of triglycerides in the blood, but lower levels of cholesterol, and the other one has high levels of cholesterol, but low levels of triglycerides. Which of them are really in danger of getting arteriosclerosis? You see, I would, I would go even deeper. I, I think I know what you're getting at. You know, um, many people would say that 
that all of these are risk factors. And, and if you're looking at cholesterol, obviously it depends on which kind of cholesterol you're looking at, HDL or VLDL and so on. So there, there are differences. <clears throat> but I think that looking at triglycerides and looking at cholesterol is like looking at beta amyloid in Alzheimer's. <clears throat> it's obviously something that occurs. We, in, in Alzheimer's, we see beta amyloid plaques. In, in, uh, in arterial disease, we see cholesterol plaques. You know, we see fatty deposits. But to think that those, in either case, are the cause, I think, is a misconception. Um, <clears throat> what seems to be really going on here is if, if this is the, the cell that lines the artery, and, and here's the wall, here's the blood coming through, these cells sit right in the inside of the artery, and when I begin to see cholesterol depositions, fatty deposits, foam cells, inflammatory changes, it's right below these cells. But prior to this occurring down here, cholesterol deposits, for example, what I see is that these cells have shortened the telomeres, altered their pattern of gene expression, they begun to become dysfunctional, you see these little gaps appearing, you begin to get macrophages and other immune cells penetrating in here, and then you begin to get cholesterol deposition and, and atheromas and so forth. So <clears throat> from my perspective, again, I would say that to talk about triglycerides or cholesterol or high blood pressure or blood sugar as the cause of arterial disease is <clears throat> um, to misconstrue the complexity of what's going on. Not only is there more going on in terms of causation, but again, it takes me back to that practical issue, which isn't what causes this disease, but where can we fix it? You know, at what point, where is the, the most efficient point to intervene clinically and financially to prevent these things from happening in the first place or to turn back the clock and fix the disease? In the case of, of arterial disease, obviously we could put in a stent. We could snip out and replace it with one of your saphenous veins. We could, as, as I've already implied, we could lower your cholesterol, lower your triglycerides, lower your blood sugar, lower your blood pressure, again, within reason and watching complications and side effects. We can do all those things, but I don't think that's the most effective place to intervene. I think the most effective point to intervene is where I see this, this changes in gene expression here, because you know, even if I'm looking at these changes in gene expression, you could say, what caused that? Well, it turns out, for example, increased blood pressure accelerates the rate of this change. So intervening, you know, intervening with blood pressure is a very effective thing to do, <clears throat> but it hasn't actually stopped the disease because it's not the only thing causing High blood pressure is not the only thing causing these changes in gene expression. So is your diabetes. So are your, your changes in fats. So are your smoking. So, it's, so are a million other things. The most effective point in intervening is just to reset the pattern of gene expression, and that we can do. So from my perspective, all of these things are complex cascades of pathology, triglycerides, cholesterol, all important. But I still want to know where I can fix it. Very practical. I'm sort of nuts and bolts, concrete kind of guy. I just want patients to get better. Yes, that is correct. But the people in Romania hear a lot about cholesterol and have a confusing image about all these, the good and the bad one and the triglycerides. But these molecules are not there to kill us. <clears throat> well, let me point out that cholesterol isn't good or bad by itself. It's sort of a matter of how much and where. <clears throat> For one thing, if I removed all the cholesterol from your body, you'd be dead in instants. Uh, you require cholesterol as part of your lipid membranes for your cells and for a lot of other things. So you certainly can't do without cholesterol. <clears throat> and second thing is that it, it's a dynamic pool of molecules. It's not simply a matter of <clears throat> how much you have, but it's also a matter of how fast they get turned over. Uh, that's one of the reasons that we find so many complex interactions when we look at HDL and LDL and VLDL. These, <clears throat> it's not simply the level, it's how fast those things are turned over. The faster I'm turning them over, the less you are, less likely you are to have atheromatous disease. So levels themselves are what we look at, but if we were just a trifle more sophisticated, we'd look at the rate at which those molecules are being turned over. I may have a high level, but is it all staying in there or is it simply being turned over and, and, and recycled every day? That makes a difference. So it's more complex than, than any of us think. I'm sure it's more complex than that as well. There are a lot of debates concerning these so-called nasty molecules which can kill us without having any symptoms. But from what I learned from you is that they are only markers, not direct causes. What is the truth of, about all these? Because there are many debates. Well, the truth again is, is 
not only more complex than most people realize, I'm sure it's more complex than I realize as well. Uh, <clears throat> and as I say, it's certainly not a matter of cholesterol is good or bad. It's absolutely not a matter of just the level of your HDL or LDL. Um, because again, it, it's a relationship between the different cholesterol types and between the fatty acids and your blood pressure and your smoking and it goes on and on. But it's again even more complex than that that I know about because it also involves, as I say, dynamic turnover of these molecules. So in fatty acids, for example, it's not just how many you have, but how fast are they being oxidized? And how fast are you replacing the ones that are oxidized with new molecules? So, and is it without, is that inside the cell or is that in the, in the bloodstream? And it gets, just gets it phenomenally complex. So, while it, I think it behooves all of us to, for example, <clears throat> want to keep our cholesterol down, that really isn't the answer, but it's a better answer than doing nothing. Um, the same would go for, for uh, general lipid levels, you know, but again, it depends which lipid you're looking at and the relationship between that other lipids and all the other things you do. It's, it's complicated. <clears throat> it would be like saying, um, I'm trying to think of an example, but it's um, do you <clears throat> fastening your seatbelt. You know, should you fasten your seatbelt when you drive? The answer is yes, it lowers your risk of death. But it certainly doesn't prevent death, and it also depends on whether you're fastening it while you're driving at 60, 60 miles an hour down the highway. That's not a good time to do it. Uh, it's not as simple as just fasten it, don't fasten it. That's not a panacea. Uh, and yet, yeah, you should do it. But you should also drive carefully. You should make sure your car is functional. You should watch out for other people on the road who are not driving well. You shouldn't text while you're driving. All of those things are true, and yet fasten your seatbelt. So when it comes down to things like cholesterol or, or fatty acids or other lipids, yes, there are things we can do that are useful, but they don't absolutely prevent disease, and they're certainly not the only thing we should be aware of, and there are probably better answers than all of those, like resetting gene expression. Yes, but why the maximum levels of acceptance for cholesterol had been lowered down by the establishment institutions in the last 25 years, which literally created an unusual fact. Almost every person on the world have high level of cholesterol. Well, it's like, de it's like defining obesity, you know. The, the standard joke is that everyone who's heavier than I am is obese, but I'm not. Um, and the definition of obesity is not easy. It, it, you, you know, on the one hand, um, is it the average, anybody above average for weight? No, because then it's going to change year by year as, as people's cultural eating habits change. Must be more to it than that. Well, is it the matter of, of simply death statistics? Well, that may be true, except that some very skinny people die and some very people, fat people don't. <clears throat> it also depends on, your, on, on where you are culturally. You know, it, if I'm relatively skinny. If I had been alive a thousands of years ago, for example, in Romania, the first bad harvest, I'd have been dead. Okay? There was an advantage to being able to, to retain fat in those days because sometimes the harvests were bad. On the other hand, these days, there's really no advantage in being, being able to con continue fat like that. You tend to die of heart-related diseases, arterial diseases, for example, and it's an advantage to be skinny because essentially there are no bad harvests because if a harvest fails in Romania, we import it from Czechoslovakia. You know, there's a global economy, so it, the, the thinness is sort of okay now, but it wouldn't have been okay a thousand years ago. So when I talk about obesity, Obesity for whom, when, under what cultural conditions, what other risk factors they have. But the same is true of, of lipid levels. You know, when you talk about what's an optimal level of, of LDL cholesterol, well, <clears throat> depends. Uh, another example would be uh, the, the body mass index. You find that what we define as that as normal in, the, in, the, in Europe turns out not to be as well related to, to mortality and morbidity if you look at Tonganese people who tend to have a bigger body frame. Their body mass index, if you associate it with a level of health, would be bigger than ours. So if we tell them that they should have a, they should, they're all obese, well, in a health standpoint, no, they're not. Genetically, they're bigger than we are. And you compare that to, you know, some Bantu people or some people who are Micronesian, depends on your genetic and cultural background. So when I see cholesterol levels changing, the, what we assume to be the normal levels over a period of decades, uh, to use a joke about your salt intake, I would take that with a grain of salt. Um, no, it's, uh, you know, there are cultural fashions in the medical and scientific world as well as anywhere else. And I, you know, 
other things being equal, lower cholesterol is probably good, but it's not always equal. It's like lower blood pressure. You can take an older patient who has a high blood pressure, and you lower it to what you and I might regard as normal, you find they can't function and can't think because their brains have adapted to a higher level and because they have um, less flexible arteries. So they can't have a normal blood pressure or you can expect them to have problems. Um, <clears throat> all of these things have to be taken in context. I, if you wanted a simple answer, yes, <clears throat> lower your cholesterol, but it's not simple. And I, I would discount statements from on high about what's the perfect cholesterol or a bad or good cholesterol. It's just not that simple. Yes, but even so, we have another argument and the establishment institutions postulated that from the amount of the total cholesterol, if one is having a high level of the good, then this will compensate the effects of the bad one, the HDL and LDL. Mm -hmm. Right, I know. Is that true or is there another explanation? Well, again, it, the simplistic explanation is your HDL should be higher and your LDL should be lower and so forth. Uh, simplistically, okay. But, but boy, it's more complex than that, Christian. It's just, it's much more complex than that. And, and none of those things get at the underlying real cause of pathology. Please tell us about the causes of arteriosclerosis and how much of these factors include, among others, stress. Well, as I mentioned before, you know, when you talk about cause, it's complex. It's, again, like saying what caused us to be in this interview, and the, the, the answer depends on what you're trying to ask. What do you mean cause of this interview? It's, it's sort of a, a I'll call it a, a sloppy question. So when I talk about causation of a disease, it's sort of a sloppy question. The question should be more specific. And from my perspective, maybe the easiest way to answer what's the cause of a disease is ask, what are the things that prevent it or reverse it or stop it? Because that's really what I'm trying to ask. Because once I start getting into the cause of, for example, atherosclerosis, it gets very complicated and soon you've got literally hundreds and then thousands of interacting factors like stress. So, you know, causes of atherosclerosis or coronary artery disease are legion. And the, you know, the, the classic factors that we look at, for example, would be uh, high blood pressure, high glucose, smoking, um, what am I missing, high glucose, and cholesterol. Okay, so we have cholesterol, smoking, high blood pressure, and high glucose. <clears throat> but let me point out something interesting. Those are the four classic factors. Let me point out that if I look at progeric children, progeric children are the children who at age five look like they're 70 years old. We used to have one in Romania a few years back. Um, <clears throat> these children appear to be aged. And these children die overwhelmingly of atherosclerotic disease. They get heart attacks. I knew one who was uh, throwing a ball with his father at age seven and had his massive heart attack in the backyard. They look like they're aging and their arterial systems age very fast. And yet not one of all the dozens and dozens of kids that I've known over the past now 40 years like this have had any of those four classic risk factors. They don't have high cholesterol, they don't smoke, they don't have high blood pressure, they don't have, you know, they just have none of the risk factors. So why is it that they get heart, you know, coronary artery disease? Well, it's not that those four risk factors are wrong. It's just that that's not enough. So stress is a risk factor. It increases my blood pressure for one thing, changes the way my immune system acts for another thing. Um, but again, you know, any of the risk factors you identify, the classic four, or add stress, or add other things, viral infections, they aren't enough to explain the disease by themselves. You have to dig a little deeper. So yes, stress is a factor. Yes, the four classic risk factors are a factor, but you're, you know, people aren't digging far enough yet. Let's have a scenario. And I have a model here. Since I'm an engineer, I like to engineer things for making the logic more easy. Let's say this is a blood vessel. The pressure is normal, 120 with 80, and the blood is circulating freely. At a certain moment, something in my life dramatically changed and my blood pressure suddenly rises to 200 with 140. It is said in the epigenetics that the body tries to adapt. So either the cells within the walls of the blood vessel start to divide or something is dilating or enlarging the vessel. Otherwise, it will broke. 
So this mechanism is for preventing this vascular accident. Is it correct until now? <clears throat> Partly it is. I remember that if I've got an elevated blood pressure there, the problem is probably down at the arteriole level. And what I've got is essentially a set of valves that are too constricted, hence that I've got that high blood pressure. <clears throat> and the other problem that, that occurs is that if I'm looking at that tube, <clears throat> The, the important part is not just how big the tube is, but how flexible it is. So if I have a very flexible tube, it can expand and contract. So when I get up to a, a systolic pressure of 200, it absorbs some of that pressure. So downstream, I'm not seeing quite that same pressure wave, so I'm less likely to burst. If I have a, a, a very you know, um, <clears throat> inflexible tube, it will transmit that pressure wave downstream. So again, I'm more likely to get an aneurysm. So it's not just a question of the size of the tube. It's a question of the flexibility of the tube. It's also a question of what those arterial valves are doing that are causing the constriction. Or also I have to throw in kidney function, which is an, a huge, has a huge impact on how that blood pressure is working. So yes, you're right, but boy, there's more to it than that. But is it possible that some factors from the brain trigger the mechanism? For example, add more cells so Let's make this tube larger. So I add more cells and enlarge the diameter. Yeah, but just having larger isn't going to help unless you've got a fixed blood volume. And as it turns out, in a practical sense, you don't have a fixed blood volume because it's being controlled down at the arterial level. So the biggest, you know, the, there are several factors that control blood volume or, or, or the pressure. I mean, one you've just alluded to, which is how big are the main vessels. Um, but that's seldom the one that actually functions in the body. The second one would be how much blood volume you have. Obviously, if I, I cut one of your arteries and your blood volume falls to half, your blood pressure goes down. But is it day to day, for the, the most important tool? factor is still those arterial valves that control the pressure itself. Think of them as backup valves. So it almost is never the size of the aorta or the size of the, the carotid artery that has any practical impact. It's a matter of the blood volume, seldom a big deal and the arterial control, which really controls the blood pressure. But is it possible if that pressure stays high long enough in order to make the body adapt to the new values, would that be possible that the body might enlarge the vessels for compensate the high pressure? Well, in one sense, you're completely wrong. In the other sense, you're completely right. Uh, the, the sense in which you're wrong is that the body doesn't compensate by simply building more cells and enlarging the aorta. It doesn't happen, except in the case of aneurysm. <clears throat> but then it's a pathology. But the case in which you're entirely right is that if I increase the blood pressure, for example, in the aorta, I'm increasing what's called the rheologic stress, that is, the, <clears throat> the pressure stress on those cells. So, for example, if I'm a cell on an arterial wall in the aorta, like the cells you're just alluding to there, as the pressure wave comes through, it's tearing at those cells constantly. It's causing a stress on the cell, at the cellular level on the cells lining your tube. So again, pulse, 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 and that can cause damage to the cell. When that happens and I lose a cell, that means the remaining cells have to divide to replace the missing cells, which happens all the time. And the higher the blood pressure and the higher the pulse pressure, the higher the rheologic stress, the more cells are going to need to be replaced which accelerates the rate of aging, which means those cells are going to dysfunction, which means I'm going to get aneurysms, atheromas, atherosclerotic disease generally. So in that sense, you're dead on. Let's presume now that a second incident comes in my life and this long-term high blood pressure gets lower and if it stays lower long enough, then the vessels are too large for transport the blood forward. So the vessels may contract, but if they do that, so let me have this tube model again, and if I squeeze the tube, then I create a mess of something inside, which perturbs the circulation of the blood. Yeah, again, and, um, it, it, you're, it, part, partly you're right, because it, in some sense, that's exactly what happens. You increase the rheologic stress, so the, the, the flow stress. Um, and what happens is, if you take that same tube, and those cells begin to show changes in gene expression that become dysfunctional, begin to get cholesterol plaque, that bulges out, has a bowing out into the tube, the aorta, for example, or the carotid artery. 
And the outcome of that is you've increased the stress of flow. That is, the, the flow trying to go downstream has, has, has uh, obstructions. You know, and so you're beginning to get a disrupted flow. That itself increases the rate of damage to the cells. Anything that, it, it's just like a, a river. If I have a river going downstream and things are flowing perfectly, and I put a huge boulder right on one side of the river, the flow begins to disrupt around, and the next thing you know, it's carved out one of the banks, and it's flowed back the other way, and that increases the stress. That's exactly what happens, in some sense, in major arterial vessels in the body. If I get an, an atheromatous plaque, a, an atherosclerotic lesion in the heart, in the aorta or the carotid arteries, I'm increasing the damage because it's moving the flow around and causing even more pressure waves. Yes, but uh, the old logic of medical thinking of the 20th century is already telling us, oh, but look, immediately after this event, LDL arrives and engulf these degenerated cells or fragments. And then macrophages arrive and consume the LDL, which contain these degenerated cell fragments. It'd be nice if it did that, and to some extent I'm sure it does, but that doesn't reset the pattern of gene expression that's changing into endothelial cells, so they're still acting dysfunctional. So even if you clean up the lesion, you're still more prone to get another lesion because the cells that triggered it are still there and they're worse than ever. So are these those atheroms they are talking about, I mean those clusters of LDL degenerated cells or fragments, the macrophages which later are making the so-called foam cells, all these creates the atheroms or describes an atherome? Yes, and I still would ask why did that happen in the first place? And again, going upstream a step, I find that it's the endothelial cells which, which triggered that. And then you ask, why are the endothelial cells acting funny? And you see this pattern of gene expression changing. Why did that happen? The telomere shortened. Why did that happen? Because every time a cell divides, telomere shortened. So what happened is you're losing an endothelial cell, the same way that I lose, cell if I do, lose cells in my skin if I do this. Well, the, the pressure waves through my aorta and the other arteries are making some cells come loose and die, and I'm replacing them with new cells, but that changes the pattern of gene expression, and the result is the foam cells, the macrophages, the you know, cholesterol deposition, the atheroma in general. <clears throat> and, and you can even go further upstream and ask, you know, well, then why did the pressure cause that change? Well, high blood pressure and against smoking. Back to the question I asked, <clears throat> that's a whole cascade, a complex cascade of disease. Where can I intervene? Where's the best place to intervene? I can intervene with blood pressure control or to get like, quick smoking and so forth. But I think that the most effective single point of intervention is to reset the gene expression itself. And when we do this in animals, it works fine. And we find that we can take, you know, we proved 17 years ago that we can take old coronary artery tissue from human beings if it looks diseased. And if we reset the telomere, we can now grow young vascular tissue in the lab. So we know we can reset the aging not only of just cells, but tissues. But the question is, can we do it in, in humans? Well, we know we can also do it in animals. So again, after Alzheimer's, the next step is to take this to human trials and see if we can actually prevent and cure atherosclerotic disease. Yeah, so I would be happy not to blame the LDL that arrives when macrophages that arrive later the strange thing of the old medical thinking is that they are trying to blame something and don't like to have things unexplained. So we can go beyond the first element which had been issued as cause and see that this was only an effect and there is a second cause behind it and then we also discover that this one too is an effect of something else behind, and so on, and so on. We can track back causes infinitely. It's like the old childhood question. You know, your four-year-old child comes to you and says, uh, and you say, uh, you know, the sun rose, and they say, why? You say, well, because it goes around the, oh, why? Well, because of gravity, well, why is there, you know? You can go through why questions infinitely, and the child will never stop asking. Everything you say, they'll ask why. But the same is true of causation in general medically. If I say, <clears throat> why did your cholesterol go up? I, you can give me an answer. And I can say, well, why did that happen? And you can give me another answer. And I can say, why did that? And it never ends. Anytime you're involving biologic mechanisms, 
you can continue to track back causation potentially infinitely. <clears throat> uh, and that's worth doing in some sense. It gives you a, a better understanding, as it would the child who asked about why the sun come up, about how things happen. <clears throat> but if the real question is, you know, will the sun come up tomorrow? That's a different question. Yes, it will. If the real question is, can we cure uh, arterial disease? Then I don't need to just know this whole chain of causation. I need to understand where to step in, how to fix it. What about calcium deposits on the arteries without having high cholesterol level? You know, there certainly are cholesterol deposits there. I, I used to joke, and it's still true, <clears throat> that you know the problem with older people is not that they have too little calcium or too too much calcium. The problem is the calcium's in the wrong place, so that their bones are losing calcium, but their aortas are gaining calcium. And and we've we've seen cases in postmortem where you can literally you know take a, a hammer or anything and hit an aorta and crack it because it's that it's like an eggshell. It's stiff. Um, <clears throat> So it does happen, but one of the common features you find in inflammation is cholesterol deposition. So I can get, for example, <clears throat> a repeated inflammation in my arm or a joint or a muscle and, or an aorta or an artery anywhere. And what you find is that, you know, along with inflammation in general and an, and an active immune response is that you'll often see cholesterol deposition as well. So it's a, it's a side effect, it's an end result, and it's critical, but it's not the cause of it. For example, if what I did was lower my cholesterol intake, that won't prevent cholesterol deposition from the aorta. If what I do is raise my cholesterol intake, that won't by itself prevent osteoporosis. There's more to it than that. It's not quite that simple as just you need less, you need more, and yet it plays a role. What other complications might appear to patients having long-term atherosclerosis? Yeah, lots. Um, one classic one would be peripheral vascular disease. Uh, you know, what you find, <clears throat> for example, if I were to measure the total capillary volume in your body, not just the arteries or the veins or the arterioles, but all the little guys, the capillary, the capillary volume in your body, as you age, it goes down. There's what's called capillary pruning. So while you, if it were a tree, you still have the trunk and the major branches, but all the little twigs are gone. You know, that you, you've lost something. Uh, and that has a huge impact. And we tend not to think about that. We think about coronary artery disease and clots and thrombus and aneurysms, but we don't realize that all the little people are gone, and they are, they're pruned. So one of the things you see is peripheral vascular disease, and a classic example of this would be the older person who gets cold easily in their hands. Well, there are lots of causes of that, but one of them is capillary pruning. The same thing is true of, of their, their ability to heal distally. Now, you know, in an older person, my skin will wrinkle, and it'll be more prone to infection, and less prone to heat, less it'll heal less quickly. And some of that has to do with the, the cell turnover in, in the cells themselves here, but it also has to do with capillary pruning. It means my immune cells can't get out as quickly and as far to get at infections. Yeah, I can't provide as much blood to promote healing uh, or in my bones to, to turn over bone. So capillary pruning is an enormous effect on older people. And yet most people don't even think about it. They just think, yeah, my grandfather's colder than, than he was last year. Why is that? Uh, capillary pruning is part of it, as well as lower metabolic rate and so forth. So that's one example of it. Um, <clears throat> but arterial disease <clears throat> manifests itself in many ways. Um, if I have this capillary pruning, that means I'm going to have weaker muscles that are less able to respond to stress, for example, long walks. Well, it's true for lots of reasons. Uh, again, the, turns out the muscle themselves, you're losing muscle mass. Partly that's because of cell senescence in the myocytes that replace some of the muscles. But it's also because <clears throat> it's hard to have muscles that, that are functional if you're not supplying them with oxygen and sugar and all the nutrients they need and taking away carbon dioxide waste products, capillary pruning. So <clears throat> capillary pruning occurs throughout the, throughout the body, not localized to anything in particular, but it has a huge change in your function as you get older. And it's far from the only change. Again, their metabolic turnover slows down, gene expression changes throughout. But there's one example. What else were you thinking about? <clears throat> I already asked uh, this question in part one, but now we need to reconnect the answer to part four because our viewers will relate to part one. Is there any possible connections or complications between atherosclerosis and stroke? Oh, yes. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> As I say, the, 
you know, strokes are generally divided into two categories, the hemorrhagic stroke and the ischemic stroke. And the hemorrhagic stroke is where the vessel bleeds, uh, and the ischemic stroke is where the vessel is blocked. Uh, but in both cases, um, there are links to the, the underlying aging of the cells that line the vessels. In both cases, those cells are failing to function. In one case, that means that they are more likely to tear and result in bleeding. In the other case, you're more likely to get clots that adhere to the vessel wall or that start as a result of cell aging and then later on plug the vessel. Um, but all of these are related at an underlying level because the endothelial cells that line those vessels show changes in gene expression, changes which we can reset. So aging itself and cell aging within the, within the arterial system is responsible ultimately for both of those kinds of strokes. In a PubMed paper on the abstract, the author said, histamine receptors are present on the surface of various normal and tumor-derived cell types. Here we report that histamine not only stimulates cell proliferation under serum-free conditions, but also is chemotactic for human carcinoma. Code closed. My question now is for the normal cell. Is really histamine also stimulating normal cell proliferation at a certain level, of course, without making cancer? Or histamine only delayed their membranes? No, both. 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 <clears throat> yeah. So, so histamine is going to have direct vasoactive effects. Uh, for example, so if I have an anaphylactic shock, say I'm allergic to penicillin and you inject me with penicillin, one of the things that will happen is my blood pressure will just plummet. Okay? A direct vasoactive, vasoactive effect. Um, <clears throat> but you're right. Uh, any, any number of compounds, histamine among them, but they're, they're probably literally hundreds, probably thousands. Of, of compounds that will have an effect on, on cell division. Okay, sometimes very direct effects, sometimes very, very indirect effects through other, other intermediaries. But um, so, as I said, if I increase your blood pressure, one of the effects will be to lose cells that line the artery and increase the rate of cell division. So I, I accelerate cell aging. And histamine may well do that too. Anything that accelerates cell division will accelerate cell aging, will accelerate disease. And the loss of telomeres. Yes, and again, it's not that telomeres cause this, they're just one part of this entire chain of pathology. From my perspective, the only advantage telomeres have is it's an effective point to intervene. Otherwise, nothing special about them at all. They're just part of the whole mechanism. And regarding the earlier mechanism that I was talking about using the model, what happens when the body is no longer having the ability to adapt and divide cells or enlarge their membranes due to the fact they'll have no telomeres, so the cells don't divide. Then when another episode of high blood pressure appears, the cells cannot dilate and the blood vessels broke. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, in, in almost all uh, clinical cases, the cells continue to be able to divide, but two things. One is they're dividing a lot more slowly, and two is the cells that divide are not as functional, as effective as other cells. Example, if I look at my skin, and if I were six years old and I cut myself, that will heal very rapidly. Now, I'm more than 10 times older than that, and if I cut that, it's going to heal but much more slowly. So, the, it's, and even if I were 120, you'll still get cell division, you still get healing, but not very quickly. Now, because it's not very quick, the outcome, for a number of reasons, is also that the skin is thinner. Whether I'm looking at the actual superficial skin or the deeper skin, the dermis, or the epidermis, the layers thin, and I'm going to get loss of fat cells and so forth. This Ultimately, though, almost no matter how old I am, the cells are capable of division, but not quickly enough to keep up with the needs. The second thing is that as these cells become more senescent, as they become older, not only are they slower to divide, but because of the changes in gene expression, they're not as functional. So, for example, these cells not only don't heal as fast as they did when I was six years old, but they're responsible for turning over collagen and elastin in the skin, among other things. Those are outside the cells, but they're continually being recycled. In a young person, they're recycled very fast, so the collagen and elastin gets turned over rapidly. And in consequence, if they get damaged, nobody knows because it's turned over so quickly. 
But in myself, as I get older, the collagen and elastin turnover is slowed down. So that means if I damage it from sun, from chemicals, just from aging, denaturization, spontaneous isomerization, you name it, any changes in the collagen or elastin aren't changed as fast. They're not recycled as fast. So in consequence, I begin to get wrinkles. And I begin to get skin that tense rather than going down as quickly as it should. Or it has valleys or ridges, as I say, wrinkles. And that's because it's not that the cells don't divide. Cells are dividing just long or slowly, and they're not as functional. So they're not taking care of the housekeeping chores, turning over collagen, turning over elastin as fast. So I lose the, that flexibility into my skin, and I lose the, the, you know, the tensile strength. That's aging. Same thing goes on in your arteries. What happens when a patient having uh, arteriosclerosis is also having constant high blood pressure or low blood pressure? Well, they're both bad for different reasons. You know, in the case of high blood pressure, you increase your long-term stress to those, those arteries to increase the risk of hemorrhagic stroke or aneurysm come to mind right away. Um, in the case of low blood pressure, you've got a sort of a more acute problem. Um, you know, if, if you can't stand up because your blood pressure is so low, well, that's a real problem. Or you just don't have enough blood pressure to supply your kidneys, for example, or your brain, for example, or your heart, for example. That can result in just about immediate death. So low blood pressure can be an immediate cause of death. High blood pressure increases your risk of an immediate event, like an aneurysm bursting. Uh, but it doesn't usually cause death immediately. It just in continually increases your risk as it goes up. Low blood pressure can result in death pretty quickly. Um, so neither one is very good. Both are a danger. And part of the problem, as I mentioned before, with, with older vessels like the aorta is they become stiff. They're not as flexible. So if I have a lower or high blood pressure, rather than responding to it by, by, by adapting to it with elastic, elastic response, it doesn't. So... Uh, so if I were to look at the blood pressure way out in my capillaries, in a normal young person, it's just sitting right around here. That is, in the aorta, you're getting bump, 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 bump. But as you go further out, it's damped. So out here, you've got pretty much constant flow. Those coral, uh, capillary arteries just flowing right along. But as I get older, these vessels get stiffer. So what you're finding is you're still getting this, this bulge of pressure here, but now it's being transmitted outward because it's no longer absorbing or damping some of the pressure. And in consequence, out here, you're beginning to get things like intermittent failure flow. Instead of it just flowing nicely, it's going boom, boom, boom. You're beginning to see the pressure wave out there. And in a small enough vessel, if you stop it, it doesn't start again. So all sorts of problems occur as a result of changes in blood pressure. And the older you get and the, the more stiff your vessels get, among other things, the more this ends up causing peripheral problems that you may not even see when you measure blood pressure, per se. But out in the periphery, it's a disaster. And if we combine these two examples, how would you explain an oscillating blood pressure of a patient varying from very low values to very high values in the same day? Uh, again, I, you know, I have to see the patient in, uh, that you've got in mind. But you remember I was talking earlier about Parkinson's disease and how there's a feedback loop. And in a young, healthy person, the feedback is so good that there's no, in most people, no observable tremor. It's there microscopically, but you don't see it. Whereas with Parkinson's disease, the feedback is a little too slow and you begin to see this sort of thing. So you begin to get a visible tremor. The same thing can happen in a conceptual sense, it can happen with regard to blood pressure. <clears throat> Let's give you an example. Let's say that I have an arterial valve here that's responsible for damping blood pressure peripherally. And what it's trying to do is maintain an optimal pressure. And in a young person, there's a very flexible vein or flexible artery here. So as you get these peaks of pressure, you know, systolic diastolic, systolic diastolic, by the time it gets out here, it's a pretty steady pressure, okay? Now I've got uh, both some vasoactive compounds, some, some hormones, think of them as, and a nervous system that's controlling this. So whenever it sees a too high a pressure, it relaxes. And when it sees too low a pressure, it contracts to even out the blood pressure. Now normally, it sees a pretty steady pressure because it's being damped over here. Now this damping begins to fail. Now this, this our little arterial valve here is seeing pressure spike, no pressure, pressure spike, no pressure. So one of the things that happens since it's older is it's trying to respond, but instead of a steady pressure, it sees a high pressure, so it relaxes, but then it's a low pressure, so now it's kind of contract, and in short, there's a feedback loop that's going awry. It begins to, as it were, have a tremor. Um, <clears throat> the outcome, again, is a disaster because the built-in feedback is not working right. 
Now, <clears throat> that would be true sort of moment to moment because it can't keep up. But there are other feedback loops, again, hormonal ones, for example, and, and interactions with the kidney that have a, a, a higher time or a, a slower time course. They don't respond moment to moment. They respond over a period of hours or days. So <clears throat> if those get involved, then you get the sort of thing you're talking about. You've got a patient in the intensive care unit, and their pressure <clears throat> right now is too high, and an hour from now it's too low, and then it's too high, and then it's too low. Because, again, your body is trying to catch up with these things, but the time course is wrong. It's failing to, er, to achieve the right feedback loop, and the, the consequence is these wild fluctuations. Think of this as an example. It's not, it's not an accurate one in terms of the exact fluid dynamics, but it gives you a feel for it emotionally. Take a, a hose. And you've got a hose with water coming out of it, not a very high flow, and it sits there calmly. Now you increase the pressure of that hose. Now it starts to do this, waving all over. That sort of failed feedback is what you're beginning to see in some of the older systems. There, there is a sense that too much is going on at once, and they begin to waver back and forth madly. Again, it's not the right physics of it, but it gives you an emotional feel for what's happening when these feedback loops get out of whack you begin to get wild fluctuations. This is a very complex and fascinating science, and I couldn't previously understand these mechanisms. So I always relate it to the mainstream thinking of the 20th century. And I thank you a lot for teaching me and making me aware of these knowledges. It's complicated. Yeah. And, it, and it, there, you know, everything goes sort of awry as we get older but I think we begin to understand why that complexity is there now. And as I say, more importantly, maybe we're beginning to understand where's the best place to fix it. It is said that diet can only help for reducing 20% of the total level of cholesterol in the blood. But what happens with the rest of 80% which are created by the liver through a process called biosynthesis? That's a good point. Now, people tend to think of cholesterol as just something you eat, but you're right that the majority of it, 80%, for example, is cholesterol you make, and your body cannot survive even a moment without cholesterol. It's absolutely required in lipid membranes and elsewhere. You know, the, the membranes of your cells require cholesterol, as do other things. Um, so your body makes cholesterol, and if, in, in a perfect world, your body would have an optimal level of cholesterol and if you ate too much, it would make less. And if you ate too little, it would make more. And it would maintain the optimal level. Um, now, the truth is, one, everybody has different levels. Two, everybody eats different amounts of cholesterol foods. Uh, three, there is no quite optimal level. The, the level actually shifts from time to time, not only as we age, but with day-to-day -day events. Um, so it not only has to be optimal, it has to be able to adapt to an optimal that changes day-to-day, hour-to-hour, month-to-month. It's not enough to have the optimal. You have to have a running, a dynamic optimal. Um, so all of these things play into it. So when you talk about decreasing dietary cholesterol, maybe that's good, maybe that's bad. It sort of depends how your body responds to it. It depends on your genes, your age, and what you're doing day to day. It's not that simple. It's easy to say, and it probably needs saying, that most of us probably do some good to lower your dietary cholesterol, but... It's far from the answer, way, way, way off base. It's not that simple. Many researchers blame the LDL sneaking behind the endothelium and there is no cell degenerated materials. So just LDL is sneaking there, apparently without any reason. But as I previously understood, this should be the other way around. The degenerated cells, which appears on the inside wall of the arteries, attract the LDL and make it sneak behind them. Well, again, as with everything else, it's not that simple. <clears throat> Remember, I talked about the endothelial cell, and then there's the subendothelial space, and there's the wall of the vessel. More complicated than that, too, but let's just take those three areas. Here's the outer wall, here's the subendothelial space, and here's the endothelial cells. I'm leaving out lots of things. But if I'm saying I'm getting LDL accumulation quote, sneaking in here, one of the questions you have to ask is, how did it sneak through? Did it? And one of the things we find is that in older cells, as these cells shorten telomeres, you begin to get these small spaces between the cells that lets LDL get in here, and macrophages, and other things. But we also know that you can get cholesterol produced 
by these cells. They produce their own cholesterol, too. So the question is, even if it didn't sneak through, even if it was produced locally, why is it producing it now when you're 70 and not when you're 7 years old? Why is it beginning to accumulate here? And again, it turns out if we measure what's going on in these cells, their turnover of things like cholesterol and lots of other things has slowed down. So you begin to find that things that normally would be turned over are now sitting around here at oxidizing, denaturing, cross-linking with other things around them, causing inflammation, whereas before that didn't happen. So it's, it's not as though the LDL cells are some sort of a voluntary secret agents that go around sneaking in. Partly they get in where they shouldn't be allowed to get in, and partly they get produced and not turned over where they should be not produced as much and turned over faster. So it's, again, complicated. I thank you very much for this very long interview. I thank you for the time and kindness to answer 101 questions. This was a marathon of 101 questions. Really? Thank you. Yes. Thank you for the fun. It's good to see you again, Christian. Me too. Thank you for this opportunity. And after the programs will be aired, all episodes will be then available later on my YouTube account and you may share them with your co-workers and friends. And let's meet again after you'll begin the first human trials in 2018. Perfect, let's do it. Okay, and I'll speak with my friends and acquaintances and analyze the perspectives for 2018 to invite you for a lecture in Cluj-Napoca. It'd be my pleasure. Thank you, my friend. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Fiți alături de noi data viitoare la o nouă întâlnire cu știință și cunoaștere.